So they could have locked you in your home or they could have removed you from your home with the force of police. That was also in the regulation. And they didn't even have to prove you were sick. They didn't have to prove you were exposed to a communicable disease. And I read this thing and I said, this is 100% totalitarianism. Welcome to this Peak Prosperity Podcast. I am your host, Chris Martinson. And at this stage, I have to ask this about the U.S. court system. Just how broken is it? From the very top, with a weaponized Department of Justice being wielded against Trump, for example, New York State doing the same things at the district level, appellate courts coming up with some extremely bizarre, if not entirely indefensible decisions, always in favor of big pharma, big business, big government, all that, against we the people. It's time to take a closer look at the all-important third branch of government, the judicial system. Today's guest is a true hero in every sense of the word, courageously defending both the rule of law and her fellow citizens against an out-of-control state government. Her story will shock you as it does me, both for its insane details, but also in what it implies about the perilous state of decline of our justice system. Bobby Ann Cox has been practicing law in New York for 25 years, and she is also a fellow at the Brownstone Institute, where I first met her at a Brownstone retreat. Bobby Ann excels in transactional regulatory and litigation law. She used to work at the renowned international law firm Nixon Peabody LLP in Manhattan, and now she leads her own firm, Cox Lawyers PLLC, located just north of New York City, where she represents clients in lawsuits against municipalities, challenging unjust property assessments imposed by the government and things like that. However, The case we're here to discuss today concerns her suit against New York State Governor Kathy Hochul and the Department of Health in a case involving unconstitutional isolation and quarantine procedures. She won that landmark case convincingly. We're speaking today because of what happened next. Bobby Ann Cox, welcome to the program. Thank you so much for having me on, Chris. It's great to be here. Well, it's really wonderful to have you. So, Bobby Ann, let's start at the beginning with COVID. Uh, You were practicing law, living your life just like the rest of us were. Then this COVID thing came along. And of course, New York City was one of the epicenters of disease and death, thanks in no small measure to then Governor Cuomo's decision to ship sick COVID patients directly into old folks' homes. Different story for a different day. How did you experience those times? What happened for you? Yeah. So in March of 2020, uh, as you mentioned, our governor at the time was Andrew Cuomo. And uh, he said statewide, everybody locked down, you know, stay home, close your businesses, close your schools. You know, he kept saying two weeks to flatten the curve. Um, and when he said that, the hair on the back of my neck stood up because I, as you said, I, I've been practicing law for 25 years in New York State, and I'm used to dealing with municipalities and government and I know they don't work that fast. Two weeks, nothing gets done by the government in two weeks. And furthermore, I knew that he didn't have the power to tell New Yorkers to do that. So from day one, it was not, I mean, yes, COVID was scary. People didn't know what it was. It was brand new. We had never seen this before. It was something that apparently was in almost every country of the world, you know, simultaneously. It was really strange and people were scared. But what the government was doing from day one to its people in the name of COVID, in the name of COVID safety, in the name of health protection, was horrendous. Um, You know, the governor can't tell you to stay home and not go to work and not go to school. Um, And people obeyed because they were scared and they didn't know what was going on. So they gave up that freedom. They gave up that right. And it continued. It continued for a few years, as we saw. I mean, here in New York, the lockdowns, <laughs> excuse me, here in New York, the lockdowns lasted for months. They didn't last for two weeks. Um, and I was seeing, because my background was real estate based law um, and dealing with local government on behalf of property owners, 
I had a lot of people coming to me and saying, you know, I, I'm going to lose my property. I mean, it, the government is telling me I can't go to work. Uh, you know, they're telling me to, or if they were a business owner, they're telling me to shut my business for weeks on end or months on end. You know, the governor started saying, oh, well, I'm going to tell you who's essential and who's not essential. And the essential workers can go to work and the non-essential workers can't go to work. And, you know, I mean, again, completely unconstitutional, completely unprecedented in our history. And so mm -hmm. people were reaching out for help and my hands were tied. I couldn't even help them because all of these rules, all of these mandates were completely unconstitutional. But the courts were not responding to the to the lawsuits that were being brought because there were lawsuits brought in 2020. You know, people started to push back uh, eventually, not in the beginning of 2020, but eventually 2021, we saw people bringing lawsuits to push back against the government. 2022, you know, and it goes on and on. But in the beginning, the courts were not going to listen to uh, the constitutional powers that the people have. Um, courts only really respond to what the social atmosphere is. Um, and if that social atmosphere is fear and um, people not standing up for their rights, uh, people giving the government power that it shouldn't have, the courts are going to respond accordingly. Now, <clears throat> it was a real eye opener for me one day when um, attorney Robert Barnes explained to me, he said, look, Chris, there's there's the court of law and then there's the court of public opinion. And so what I hear you saying is that court of public opinion was sort of fear based. And so the courts are supposed to be these very rational, very, you know, down to the letter. What is the wording? You know, what is the law? And they're supposed to administrate that in some capacity. But they were responding instead to this other stuff. Um, and, and so, OK, let's OK. There was some fear. Got it. But that lifted pretty quickly. We, we developed a very quick view within six months of COVID. We knew that it was heavily age stratified in terms of its risk profile, that in fact, you know, non-essential should have been um, people over the age of 70. <laughs> you know, everybody under the age of 70 was essential. You can go back to work, right? We could have done it that way. What was happening in New York at the time? Like, how did they actually, like, who decided who's essential, who's non-essential? How did that decision get made? Yeah, that was made by Governor Cuomo. Uh, again, completely unconstitutional. He doesn't have, no governor has the power to tell certain people you can go to work and live your life and uh, be normal. And then other people, sorry, you can't leave your house or your, your apartment. No, that the governor does not have that power, uh, <clears throat> nor does the legislature, but it was coming from the governor. And, uh, you know, there were lawsuits being brought, as I said, and it was really, you know, I mean, Cuomo was going crazy with this power. Because he, in March of 2020, he was given a special emergency power by the New York State Legislature uh, where they said he would have the ability to make directives, which really were laws. They were calling them directives. <clears throat> that in and of itself was unconstitutional. The, the legislative branch of government cannot delegate its lawmaking power to another branch. Uh, that is not allowed. But they did it anyway. And of course, Cuomo accepted the responsibility and he... Uh, had a ball issuing directives for an entire year, um, you know, and, and that year in 2020, he said for Thanksgiving, for example, this was one of his directives, um, <clears throat> you could not have more than 10 people in your house for Thanksgiving. I mean, again, completely unconstitutional. The governor doesn't have the power to limit how many people come into your house. Okay. It's absurd. Um, but he was doing it. And because of the fear, a lot of people, not all people, but a lot of people were following along. You know, people were saying without coming out and saying it, oh, OK, you're going to you government, you're going to protect me. You're going to keep me safe. OK, I'll, I'll give you my power. I'll, I'll, I'll give you my rights and just tell me what to do. Just keep me safe. You know, it, it, it's not the way that it's supposed to work. The government is not there to keep you safe. The government is supposed to be there to make sure that our laws and our society is built upon a society of laws, law and order, 
and that those laws are enforced. Uh, but the Constitution was written to keep the government in check. The Constitution was not written to keep the people in check. And mm-hmm. any power that is not delineated in our Constitution and given to the federal government in the Constitution is reserved for the people or, or the states, you know, the local government. People have lost sight of that. And, and, and unfortunately, it's led us to where we are today with complete government overreach into every area of our lives. Now, they did blur things pretty heavily, right? What's the difference between and this was an education for me because I was just not I was leading my life and the courts are over there and I didn't didn't get involved in them because I didn't get in trouble or whatever. Right. You know, didn't have issues around that. But so all of a sudden we were hearing things like mandates. But is a mandate a law? And they tried to blur that. There's a rule. What's a rule? Um, who makes a rule? Is that different from a law? So all these things suddenly sud- came out and they were presented to me as a citizen as if they were laws. Like, like these are things you have to do. And of course, people lost their job because of mandates, right? And we watched like one agency and in, in, I'm working with a case right now with somebody where the CDC recommends that six month olds get, get shots. And the DCF here, our Department of Children and Family Services has, has interpreted that as a, as a rule, you, you must. So a recommendation has become a mandate, which is a, a, a actual rule that people will get in trouble if they don't follow. Was this an intentional blurring or has it always been this blurry? Did something new happen because of COVID? What's going on? Yeah. So what you're describing is what I call, um, you know, the regulation nation, um, it, the administrative branch. Uh, let me let me rephrase that. Uh, the administrative arm of our government is under the executive branch. So we have just going back to like, you know, grade school history class, we have three branches of government, judicial, which is the courts and the judges, the legislature, which is our lawmakers, right, our senators, our House representatives. And then we have the executive branch, which at the federal level, that's Biden and his agencies. And then at the state level, it will be your governor and the agencies under the governor. So those agencies operate underneath the executive branch and they are not empowered to make rules or make laws. They definitely can't make laws. Laws only come from our legislature, our elected representatives. But what has happened, particularly over the past few years with with COVID, but even it was happening before that, the administrative state, the administrative, those people, those bureaucrats that work in those agencies in the executive branch have been giving themselves a power that they don't have. There is not a fourth branch of government. They are not a branch of government. They are under the executive. They can only, agencies can only make rules if they are given the power by the legislature. So this is the way administrative law works. The legislature, the lawmaking body, our state senators, our state assembly members, and then at the federal level, that would be Congress. They have to say to an agency, they have to make a law, right? And then they can say to the agency, okay, you can make some rules to help us implement this law because the executive branch is supposed to enforce our laws. But an agency can't just make up a rule that it wants to just because it wants to. So I'll give a good example so that your your, <clears throat> your viewers can understand what I'm talking about. So um, the CDC, the Center for Disease Control, if you remember back in 2020, the CDC came out and issued, now that's, that's an agency and that's under the president. So it's the executive branch, came out and issued a rule that said all landlords, in the United States of America, no matter what state you were in, could not evict their tenants for non-payment of rent because it will spread COVID. Okay. There is no law that enabled them to make that rule, but they made the rule anyway. And what did we see happen? We saw many tenants, not all, many tenants stopped paying their rent because you had a federal agency telling them, Well, you can't get evicted. You know, you don't, if you don't pay your rent, your landlord is forbidden from kicking you out of that property. 
So what we saw was many tenants stopped paying their rent because they knew they couldn't be thrown out. And then you saw the landlords losing their properties because most landlords in this country are mom and pop shops. They're not these big corporate conglomerates. So you saw people like you and me, just regular everyday people who were losing their properties because their tenants who they rely upon to pay the rent and they use that rent money to live their own lives, right? To pay their own bills, to pay the taxes on the property, to pay their mortgage on the property, to pay the maintenance on that property. They could no longer pay their bills on the properties because the tenants stopped paying rent because the CDC told them they weren't going to get kicked out of their house if they stopped paying rent. So we saw this horrendous overstep of agencies, again, unelected bureaucrats, making rules that they had no right to make. And then the people were suffering horrendously. Now, that that was a, what an egregious case, because the Constitution, I love it because I can actually read it and understand it. I, if we wrote the Constitution today, it would be 3,842 pages long, and it would have a lot of words in it that would be very hard to detangle, be all full of jargon, you know, notwithstanding this and accept that and double negatives and all that stuff, right? So... <clears throat> But it's very clear. It says the government cannot take. So that sounds like a taking to me. The CDC said to landlords, I'm going to, you're going to lose money. So if they, if they issued a rule and said, we're going to prevent you from evicting, but we're also going to cover your mortgage costs or, or the payments that, that are now being missed, I would have been a little softer on it, but they didn't. They just issued the edict and then pushed all the cost of that out there somewhere to mom and pop, which is wholly 100% immoral, unethical, and unconstitutional. There's no good way to skin that cat. Yep, absolutely. You're right, Chris. And you know the other thing? You know, then Congress comes along right after that with the CARES Act. And they had all this money. Well, they didn't have the money, but, you know, they put us in further debt. They generated all this money that they started sending out to people and Instead of, the, like you're saying, the right thing would have been, instead of sending that money to all these tenants who weren't paying rent, mm -hmm. you send the money to the landlords for the tenants. And you say, hey, tenant John Smith is not going to pay his rent this month, but here's his rent money. Instead of giving it to him, you give it to the landlord as a rent voucher. So now the landlord is not coming out of pocket and bearing all the burden and the tenant gets to stay in their property and they don't have to pay the rent, right? That would have been a very simple, straightforward way to handle the situation. But they didn't do it like that. And I believe they didn't do it like that on purpose. You know, it, it was, you know, a lot of people call it the great taking. You know, it was, I don't understand because that solution is so logical. I don't understand why they didn't do it that way which makes me think that they must have been doing it that way on purpose to hurt the landlords for, for, for land grabs for, I, I don't know. I really don't know the answer to that, but the right way to do it was so obvious and they didn't do it that way. So it just leaves a really big question in my mind. Yeah. And, and, and boy, I got a lot of questions about CDC, FDA on and on. This has really opened up a, my, my eyes to a lot of things. And of course, I, I struggle like you, because when I try and interpret these things through what you would call a rational or humanist framework, it's almost impossible. You're like, why? What? But if you look at it in terms of they were intentionally trying to create harm and do bad things to seize things illegally, you're like, oh, well, now this begins to fit and it all falls in, uh, begins to make more sense. So let's go to the case at hand, though. So so here you are. It's COVID. OK, like everybody, we're all struggling to make sense of this. At some point, though, you said, hold on, here's this thing that's now happening. I can't make sense of this. Talk to us about that that moment when you woke up in, in the case you took on. Yeah. So um, when COVID broke out in March of 2020, I started to immediately speak out um, and people were looking for direction because people didn't know, again, fear. They didn't know what was going on. Um, and I was trying to explain to people what the Constitution says, what your rights are, what the government can and cannot do. Um, and so I started to give speeches. People would have me go here, there, you know, talk to this group, that group and give speeches just to help educate people. And um, a citizens group formed. Uh, it's called Uniting New York State 
And one of the members of that group came to me in 2021 and showed me a regulation that had been issued through the Department of Health here in New York State. It was called Isolation and Quarantine Procedures. And it was horrendous. I mean, they handed it to me. They said, you have to read this. You know, is this for real? And I read it and I said, oh, my God, unfortunately, it's for real. But there's no way this is constitutional. What that regulation said was the Department of Health, right, unelected bureaucrats in the Department of Health could pick and choose which New Yorkers they could lock up or lock down. They could have locked you down in your home or they could have removed you from your home and put you into a detention center of their choosing. You had no choice. They could have held you there or locked you down in your house for any amount of time. There was no time restriction. So it could have been days. It could have been weeks. It could have been months. Um, there was no age restriction in that regulation. So they could have done this to you, but they also could have done it to your child or to your ailing parent or grandparent. Um, there was no procedure by which you could regain your freedom once you were locked up or locked down. And what I mean by that is when we were at the trial court level in 2022 and we were at oral arguments, the judge asked the attorney general's office, let's say you take a family. Let's say you put them into quarantine somewhere, a facility or a hospital. Once they're in there, how do they get out? And there was a really pregnant pause. And then the attorney general's office said, well, I guess they could hire a lawyer and they could sue us. You know, so no due process. And here's the biggest kicker. They didn't even have to prove you were sick. What? So they could have locked you in your home or they could have removed you from your home with the force of police. That was also in the regulation. And they didn't even have to prove you were sick. They didn't have to prove you were exposed to a communicable disease. And I read this thing and I said, this is 100% totalitarianism. There is not one ounce of due process protection built into this regulation. And our constitution says that you are entitled to the due process of law. You know, there was not even a notice requirement in that regulation, which means they didn't have to give you a notice and say, hey, you know, we think you're sick with tuberculosis and we're going to, you know, we're going to put you into a detention facility. And no, they could have just come and knocked on your door and, and said, here, here's the isolation or here's the quarantine order. Come with us. You know, absolutely unbelievable, completely wow. unconstitutional on multiple levels. Um, and so I brought a lawsuit. I, I said, there's there's no way, I, you know, and constitutional law was not my wheelhouse at the time. <laughs> Mm -hmm. But um, I couldn't find any attorneys that would bring the case. And I said, well, all right, then I guess I'm going to do it myself. Um, and I had to get, obviously, plaintiffs. So I had to team up with some New York state legislators because the whole basis of that lawsuit is that the it was the wrong branch of government that was trying to make a law, Right. They, the Department of Health did not have the power to make that regulation. There was no command from the legislature. There was no anchor statute from the legislature allowing them to make that law. And we already have a quarantine law. Probably every state in this country has a quarantine law. But our quarantine law from 1953 is full of due process protections. So an agency can't come along and make a regulation that conflicts with the Constitution, conflicts with our existing quarantine law that we've had for 70 years, agencies don't have that power. The governor does not have that power. And we won our case. The judge struck it down. He said, no, wrong branch of government. You, the agency, governor, you can't do this. And uh, my plaintiffs are uh, Senator George Borrello, Assemblyman Chris Taig, and Congressman Mike Lawler, um, together with that citizens group, uniting New York State. And um, and we got it struck down back in 2022. Um, the judge forbade the Department of Health and the governor. From oh, hold on. So, so, you, so you win it. You win a trial. So, so you're in you're in a district court somewhere, I guess. Right. Yeah, we're, we're in state court. So it was a trial court. 
trial court, and and then it gets appealed. Um, so I want to hear about that appeal. But but first, that 1953 law. I'm going to presume you said it's full of due process. Let's talk about that for a second, because because the stuff you said before is really shocking to me. That uh, an uh, um, an agency decides I'm going to deprive people of of life and liberty, potentially, right? I'm going to take them out of their lives. I'm going to I'm going to take them. You know, who knows what impact that has when you put somebody in quarantine? They can't go to work. Maybe they lose their job. There's all kinds of things around that, without even having to prove that they have a communicable disease. Because isn't the whole point of a quarantine law that somebody has provably something like you mentioned tuberculosis and but you can go and get that treated? Um, I, I presume. So talk to us. Like, how is that 53 law configured? Because it, it, it's important that I think we understand that, that how bad of a departure this other thing you're talking about is. Yeah. So um, the law from 1953 is very um, weighed. It's very balanced. Um, so the first thing that law says is that before you can even think about locking somebody up, the person has to first actually have the communicable disease that you think they have. Right. So, um, the steps that have to be taken is a doctor has to see a patient and say, oh, okay. I think this person has, again, we'll use tuberculosis. I think this person has tuberculosis. And if the doctor feels like that patient can't control themselves to to keep those people around them safe from getting their disease, right? Either they can't do it because of mental lack of mental capacity, or maybe they won't do it. Um, then that physician would refer the person to the local health department, the local health department, not the commissioner of health in Albany, the local health department. If somebody in the local health department feels like, okay, I think the doctor's right, maybe we should investigate this, then they do a whole investigation, right? At the end of their investigation, if they think the person not only has the disease, but also is unable to comport themselves in a proper manner to safeguard others, then they refer that case to a judge, right? So you go to a magistrate, a an impartial third party magistrate. And there, there's a hearing, right? Uh, you are allowed to have an attorney. You are allowed to uh, cross-examine the witnesses against you and see the evidence against you, right? It's a hearing. If at the end of that hearing, the judge, not the Department of Health, the judge feels that that person is infected with the disease and, number two, cannot comport themselves or will not comport themselves in a proper manner to safeguard others from getting that disease, then the judge can order a quarantine order where the person is put in a hospital, not anywhere that the Department mm -hmm. of Health wants, a hospital so that the person can receive the proper care to get better. And then once they're better, they are released from the hospital. So you see that it's very logical the way the law is laid out. And it, it does balance that interest of the government to keep people safe, but it also balances the rights of the person who has the disease so that that person is not crushed by administrative state and their rights are not stripped away from them. So the, the, to deprive somebody of property and income and freedom those are laws, right? Those are always have been a matter of law. That's not a matter of a rule. And I'm really glad we don't live in a place where just some agency can just sort of decide that they need my house and they can just take it or, you know, that they don't like me, so I shouldn't have a job anymore. So they, they lock me up somewhere. Um, it, so it's clear that that's a matter of law that that should be. Hopefully that's obvious. And so your case then was to find three lawmakers and to say, hey, if anybody's going to pass laws like that, it ought to be these guys here, right? So you take that to trial court. And how did the judge rule that? The judge ruled in our favor. He said um, they breached, they meaning the governor and the Department of Health, they breached separation of powers, which is clearly laid out in our constitution. They took a power from the my, my plaintiffs, from these legislators, these lawmakers, and they weren't supposed to take that power. They don't have the authority to do that. Furthermore, they also 
wrote a regulation, you know, they called it a regulation, really it was a law, but they wrote a regulation to try to override or change that 1953 quarantine law that we've had for 70 years. And agencies yeah. cannot change laws. They can't rewrite laws. They can't overrule laws. That's not the power of an agency. So he struck it down. He said, nope, sorry, unconstitute. Oh, and he even he even had a section of his decision that said, um, you know, let's talk about due process. You know, <laughs> by the way, this regulation has zero due process. I mean, he even went so far. He said uh, the regulation gives lip service to constitutional due process. I mean, he really ripped them apart. He really <laughs> he let them have it in that decision. Um, so he struck it down. He said, you cannot enforce this, no longer exists, you can't enforce it, and furthermore, you can't re-promulgate it. You know, you can't reissue it after a few months or something. So you come out of that, obviously, I mean, this is that's a pretty commanding uh, decision right there and pretty obvious, so you win. Then what happens? So um, then, that was the summer of 2022. Uh, in the November of 2022, our governor, now it was Kathy Hochul, uh, was running for election. And so was the attorney general, Letitia James. Um, so were all the state senators, all the state assembly members. So uh, the governor and Letitia James, our attorney general, wait until after the election, right? They didn't wanna raise awareness about this before. They wait till after the election, then they appeal the case. So in 2023, we spent the whole year, you know, litigating this case on on appeal. And in September, we had um, oral arguments for the case in um, the appellate division upstate, up in Rochester, New York. And, you know, 400 people showed up at that appellate division oral argument to hear me argue the case because it's that important to New Yorkers. I mean, n nobody shows up to oral or nobody even shows up to court trials, really. You know, maybe the mm -hmm. press will go to some things or whatever, but 400 citizens show up. That never happens. And they were, it wasn't a rally. It wasn't a protest. They were very quiet, very peaceful. They sat in the courtroom. They listened. Uh, there was overflow out into the, the courthouse atrium. They, the courthouse wow. actually set up chairs and an extra television in the hallway and the atrium so people could watch live stream um and and they were it meant that much to people i mean there were people there that had driven five six seven hours to to watch the oral arguments you know so it was a show of the voice of the people um but unfortunately about two months later, they issued their decision, the appellate court, and they reversed the lower court decision and then threw the case out on standing. On standing? Can you explain what that means to people? Because so standing, what what is standing? Yeah, so standing is, um, it's the notion that you can't just bring a lawsuit because you want to bring a lawsuit, right? You as the plaintiff have to actually have an injury in order to be able to bring that lawsuit. So a, a clear example would be, let's say you own a car and let's say somebody came along and stole your car. I can't sue them because it wasn't my car. I don't have an injury. Even though if I'm friends with you, even if you're a relative of mine, even if sometimes you let me borrow that car to go to work or something, I don't have standing to sue the person that stole your car. You have standing to sue mm -hmm. the person that stole that car because it was your car. So that's a simple example of, of standing. Um, the fact that the, now the appellate courts in New York state um, are panels. It was a panel of five judges. Our, our, unfortunately, our judges at that level and at the highest court level are all appointed by governors. So they're not elected by the people. Mm. Uh, so, you know, you have a situation now where this panel of judges is saying that New York state legislators don't have the right to sue an agency in the executive branch when they think that that agency has overstepped, 
and taken one of their lawmaking powers. Number one, it's illogical. It doesn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. And number two, it goes against our controlling state case law, meaning we have cases that were decided by our highest court here in New York State that specifically say legislators do have that power. They do have the right to bring a lawsuit like that. So obviously, my my plaintiffs and I, we are appealing that decision. I think it's a horrendous decision. It's definitely calamitous and can cause a lot of problems in our court system. Um, so we are appealing to the Court of Appeals, which is the highest state court. Um, so we'll we'll see what happens, you know, in this next go around. But, you know, absolutely unbelievable how brazen the the executive branch and these agencies have become. I have to ask this, though. <clears throat> I didn't read the ruling when they must have explained why they thought state lawmakers had no standing to to defend their right and ability to make laws over agencies i mean it must have how did they even frame that i i don't understand what the logical argument could have been but they must have written something down to explain that yeah so um their decision it wasn't a very long decision it was maybe three or four pages long um Ooh. yeah but they basically adopted the argument of the attorney general um, and they, in essence, claimed that these plaintiffs, these legislators that I'm representing, didn't have an injury, that their power wasn't taken by the Department of Health and the governor when they made this regulation. It really is extremely confusing because obviously the power was taken away from them. Obviously, the, the agency, the Department of Health and the governor did overstep. So it's it's a very, it's not just a bad ruling. It's, um it is confusing to people because people, you know, non-attorneys come up to me all the time and say, I don't understand how, how people who are lawmakers, they're members of the legislature, can't sue another branch when they think that other branch stole their power. Like it's a very obvious standing. Um, and it's so obvious the trial court judge didn't even spend one sentence talking about standing, right? Because it's so obvious that my, my plaintiffs have standing. So uh, it, it's really, it's Well, back to your example, this would, this would be like saying, um, Chris, your car was stolen by that person and we see you want to bring suit, but you don't have standing. Yeah, yeah pretty much. Yeah, pretty much. Okay. So, um. I, I, you know, I, I understand that, that this could be sensitive, so say what you feel like you can, but, but how do you, how do you view that it's such a bizarre ruling? So, so if I'm an appellate court judge, I know this is going on my record. I, I, I'm presumably there because I'm at a senior part in my, my, my career and I actually care about the law and how it's interpreted and my role in it. And the fact that these become permanent record, right? You know, Dred Scott, right? That's, there's certain things that you wouldn't want on your record. This is bizarre. I would not want that ruling on my record. How do you interpret their decision? It's so bizarre. Yeah, I, I, it is so bizarre. I don't know the answer to that. I wish I did know what they were thinking when they wrote this decision. Um, but the other thing that I found really strange is that, um, so it was a panel of five judges. All five of them ruled against me. All five, not, you know, not not even one or two saying, yeah, you know what? I don't think that's right. You know, <laughs> um, all five of them ruled against me. And uh, it, it's just it's confusing and it's very bad case law. Um, and like I said, because our highest court, the Court of Appeals, has already established that people like my plaintiffs would have standing in a situation like this. Um this department, this fourth department appellate division has gone against what the overarching court who's above them, who they do have to follow their precedents, um, they've gone against them. So now we have this conflict between, you know, the fourth department saying one thing about legislator standing and then the top court in New York state saying the opposite about legislator standing. So, um, it's a pretty it's a pretty important case because now we're not just fighting about is this regulation legal is it valid can it stand 
can the Department of Health throw people into quarantine facilities without proof that they're sick for however long they want? It's not just about that anymore. Now it's also about the right of legislators, lawmakers, elected lawmakers in New York State having the ability to sue when they think that their power has been infringed upon by another branch of government. It's super dangerous. If you let one branch of government become more powerful than the other branches, now we've left a constitutional republic. Now we've left a representative form of government and we've now gone into another realm. You want to call it an oligarchy? You want to call it a, I don't know, a monarchy because you have a governor who's now going to be, you know, a queen or a king. You can't let unelected bureaucrats and agencies overrule the laws that are made by our elected officials, right? You can't because, um, so that's the whole process of democracy, isn't it? Which is people vote and people get brought in and those people are there to enact the will of the people. And if the people don't like how they're enacting that, they vote them out and we start over again with a fresh crop. That's how the process is supposed to work. That's what we were all taught. That is democracy. What you're describing here today, uh, Bobby Ann, is actually the complete subversion of democracy. It is. If you allow unelected bureaucrats, if you think about it, the, the commissioner of health, whether it's the state level or whether you're talking about the federal level, doesn't matter. Even the local level, your, your county or your town, that person, that commissioner of health is appointed. They're appointed by the executive. So in this case, with my lawsuit, the governor appoints the commissioner of health. And then the commissioner of health governs over all the people that work in the Department of Health. So those are all just government employees. Not one of those people, even the person at the top, not one of those people is elected by the voters. They're not beholden to the voters. They don't have to take a pledge to uphold the Constitution. They're just a government employee. They are not accountable to the people. So you can't allow them to make rules that conflict with our laws or that conflict with our Constitution if they're allowed to overwrite a law that's passed by our elected officials, what's the point in having a legislature to begin with? There's no point in having the legislature. Just have all these, you know, kings and queens in the executive branch. No, that is not the way our country works. It's not the way it works. We have to we have to fight to make sure that that is not how it turns what it turns into. <laughs> Well, kings and queens, which is feudal or commissars, because it's a communist system, right? It's all by appointment and decree rather than the will of the people. So as I look at this, though, it, the thing that terrifies me about this is that this is in the after, like you, you mentioned, you're fighting all this in 2023. Here's what we already know by 2023. Post-Omicron era, COVID settled down into being a seasonal cold, and they're still fighting for this power, this right to lock people up under any circumstance. And my fear is, is that if they can rationalize that in their heads around a summer, you know, a common cold, well, what's next, right? Am I going to be locked down forcibly in quarantine because of climate change? Is it because of my skin color? It, whatever it is next, it's going to be whatever they think is important at, at that moment, um, you know, in their deluded minds. And, and that's very worrying. This is why I think everybody needs to actually be focusing on this. Normally, during, you know, 20 years ago, you didn't have to watch this stuff. But what you're describing is exceptionally important, what's happening, because if we don't have the rule of law, I think what follows next is anarchy, because I'm only going to follow the laws if they're fair and just. If they become completely chaotic and unjust, I don't I don't have such a strong attachment to them because they're they're clearly um, capricious and arbitrary. And that's what they're not supposed to be. So this is really important to me. Yeah, I mean, that's a great point. And I'll also add uh this regulation was not just covid specific so there was a laundry list of dozens of diseases that the department of health could claim you had without proof um in order to enforce this regulation against you so i'll give you some examples now obviously some of the diseases on there were actually, you know, they're dangerous and they are communicable. You know, you had tuberculosis, you had COVID. Okay. But there were also things on the list, like, for example, toxic shock syndrome. 
um, Lyme disease. And this one, you're not going to believe, botulism, which is food poisoning. Not communicable. No, not communicable. Now, it also isn't as, you know, I mean, tuberculosis, okay, pretty serious, you know, deadly. Botulism? You know, I mean, just, it's it's unbelievable. It, it really, I, I honestly believe if people, it doesn't matter your party affiliation. Mm -mm. If people knew their government was doing this, I really think they would stand up and say, oh, no way. Absolutely not. You are not going to take your whims, you meaning people, you know, unelected officials, you know, Department of Health members, whatever, your whim, your want, and impose it on me when it totally eviscerates my constitutional rights. No way. Who do you think you are? You know, it's like, mm -hmm. it's unbelievable. The problem is the mainstream media will not pick up this case, won't pick up the story. You know, I mean, lots of alternative media has, but not, not mainstream media. They won't touch it with a 10 foot pole. No, of course not. They're, they're, they're in on the whole, whatever this thing is that's happening now. Um, so these 400 people who showed up, how would you describe them? Uh, were they just average citizens like you and I, were they, were they potentially, how did they, how did they come to even find out about this and show up? I'm curious. Yeah. So I definitely do a lot of speaking engagements. Um, as I said earlier, uh, I started in 2020 and, and I still do it today. So I do a lot of, um, you know, whether it's a town hall or um, a local citizens group or a civic organization or whatever. So I do a lot of public speaking. And so I think um, in, in that arena of, you know, these mm -hmm. grassroots organizations that talk to each other or have me come speak to them. And so they all started learning about this. Um, and I've been speaking about this case. I mean, it's been going on for two years now already. So um, I think once they realized that there was a court date, people started to spread the word and people started to say, oh my gosh, well, let's go. You know, I mean, and it was the middle of the work week. It was a Wednesday morning. So people had to take off work either, you know, especially those people that drove a few hours to get there. Um, and the court actually, uh, they do live stream their oral arguments and you can still today, you can still watch that, um, oral argument if people want to, um, there's a website that, um, one of my plaintiffs uniting New York state, they set up a website and there's a page on there that talks specifically about this case. Um, and you can click the link, watch the oral arguments. You can read the judge's decision from the trial court. Um, there are pictures on there. There's, um, there's some videos on there. Uh, a couple of the interviews I've done about the lawsuit are posted on there. So if people want to get really nitty gritty information about this quarantine lawsuit, I would recommend um, that they go to uniting New York, uh, uniting NYS .com, um, and you just click on the, the lawsuit tab and it's, it's, it's pretty comprehensive information. I mean, people well, can also go to my website too. I have information about it on there as well. And what's that website? Um, so my website is um, Cox, spelled C-O-X, coxlawyers.com. Um, and I have a media tab on there where I have um, articles I've written about it or um, interviews I've done um, or articles that other news organizations have written about the case. I mean, it's not just about the quarantine case. I have other work that I'm doing on there as well. But people that do want to get more information and get deeper into the details, um, my website would be a good resource for that. Okay, great. And and you also you have an, a, a great Substack. How do people find that? Oh, yeah, thank you. So um, my Substack is attorneycox.substack.com. Um, or you can just go to substack.com and you can just type in my name in the search bar. But um, I write once a week. And if you sign up for the Substack, it'll automatically go into your email. And um, I pick one topic and I write an article about it. And it's generally constitutionally related. Um, mm -hmm. Sometimes it's, you know, federal level constitution. Sometimes it's state level constitution. Um, but yeah, I try to uh, explain things 
outside legal terms, um, because I know that the general public um, might not understand the legal intricacies of a lot of the cases that are going on. So I just try and break them down and explain things so that people can understand it and realize how their their rights are being violated by the government. Well, that makes them not rights anymore. They become privileges. <laughs> Big difference. So, well, thank you so much for all that you're doing. And, and by the way, a great substack, and you do a, a wonderful job explaining it. I think people need to start myself, I need to spend more time thinking about this and looking at it because it's it's really important. The courts are the system that are used to either protect or violate my most basic rights. And and increasingly, the trend is in the wrong direction by my judgment. And uh, I think it's time for us to really begin to stand up. So thank you for doing that. Really appreciate it. When is your uh, when do you think you'll the, when's the next step of this case that we've been talking about? Yeah, so um, we put our appeal into the Court of Appeals about a month, maybe a month and a half ago. Uh, so we are waiting to hear back from the court uh, to see if they're going to, um, you know, set down the case for a scheduling order or do they want more motion practice or what. So we're still in the limbo stage of seeing where we're going on this, but um, I do definitely update and I do that either through my Substack, I'll write an article, um, or I, I'm on Twitter, so I will post something on Twitter um, to update people about you know the next step and when is the next court date and stuff like that. So um, if people want to hook up with me on Twitter, it's um, attorney underscore Cox. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I would love for people to get involved. I always try and encourage people you know, you can get involved. I know people are overscheduled and busy and you can even just simply get involved by helping to spread the word, you know, take the link to this interview and share it with your friends, you know, post it on your social media, um, talk about it when you go to a, a party or an event or something. The more that we talk about these things and we share this information, the better chance we have of defeating this horrendous government overreach, which is you know, the floodgates have opened, you know, and we have to shut those floodgates. But we can only do it if more people become aware of what's going on. Indeed. Well, very well said. So, Bobby Hancox, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you for taking this case up. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks for having me on, Chris. It's been wonderful. <laughs>